Hello, and welcome back to another UKPF Lunchtime Seminar. This week, Richard Haythorpwaite from UCL is going to talk to us about Titan's atmosphere. Fortunately, there was a slight issue with the start of the recording, but we're going to jump in now where Richard's talking a bit about Titan's history. It was named by John Herschel, so that's the son of William Herschel. It was named after the mythological Titans, who are the brothers and sisters of Kronos, so that's Saturn. The first spacecraft observation was until 1979 by the Pioneer 11 space probe, and it was also examined by the Voyager probes in 1980 and 1981. It was first extensively visited by the Cassini-Huygens mission, and its atmosphere and surface were also investigated by the Huygens atmospheric probe, so that was European-led, the Huygens probe, that is. The main features we've of of Titan. So it's the, the largest moon of Saturn. It's roughly the size of Mercury with a 2,500 kilometer radii and it's tidally locked with Saturn. So the same side always faces. No, it's got the same rotate orbital period as Saturn and so it's the same rotation of 15, hours and 15 days and 22 hours. It's the only moon we've found with a substantial atmosphere. So it's got a uh, surface pressure of one and a half times of Earth. It's the only other solar system body outside Earth with a thick uh, nitrogen atmosphere. And it's the only other solar system body with stable liquid on its surface. So that's uh, a picture on the right there you can see of Titan's atmosphere and it's olive orange in color due to a organonitrogen haze, also known as uh, tholin. So these were first predicted by uh, Carl Sagan back in the 70s. Uh, going onto the surface, some of the uh, features, uh, there's dunes on the surface, so that can be seen in the, the image in the, um, well, some examples of dunes anyway, the middle top. And they're up to 100 meters tall and can stretch up to hundreds of kilometers long. Uh, on the surface, there's also uh, liquid hydrocarbon lakes made of ethane and methane. Example of that is on the right, so that's a, a false color radar image of Kraken Mare, which is the largest hydrocarbon lake on Titan. It's got a surface area of 400,000 square kilometers, and that's larger than the Caspian Sea, so quite substantial sizes. Uh, other features on the surface and subsurface, so there's evidence to support a subsurface water ocean and also layers of ice, and there's also evidence to support cryovolcanism. So cryovolcanoes don't erupt hot molten magma like they do on Earth. They erupt with combinations of water, ammonium and methane. So any of these are a combination possibly. Uh, a quick light-hearted aside because it's, I think it's a really fun fact about Titan. So by convention, the mountains on Titan are named after mountains from Middle Earth. <laughs> so you've got Agmar Montes, uh, Dumont, Erebor, and then there's also the collections of hills, coals, which are named for uh, characters from, yeah, also by Tolkien, so you can see Gandalf and Faramir, I just, I just think it's a fun fact. Uh, moving on, the why Titan is such an interesting body to study is mainly due to its astrobiology implications. So you have these hydrocarbons on the surface and possible subsurface water. So it makes it a potentially habitable environment. Uh, and the atmosphere of Titan is hypothesized to be similar to that of early Earth, except that Titan doesn't have as much water vapor. And the, the complex organic molecules that are seen in the haze, so these, uh, these carbon nitrogen compounds are expect to, expected to settle on the surface, founding some basis for biochemistry. And as, as you have these, these hydrocarbon lakes, you have a solvent. So there could be life as we don't know it, which uses, instead of water, uses this ethane and methane that's been discovered. But I'll be mainly focusing on the atmosphere and ionosphere in this talk. So I will cover some background in there. There's this um, figure on the right. You can see there's a lot of information on it. Uh, lots of different chemistry, uh, bits of chemistry going on. So we found the major atmospheric species in Titan's atmosphere is nitrogen up to 97%. There's also methane 2.1% and then a little bit of hydrogen at just under 0.15%. Uh, 
Uh, the composition of these neutrals has been examined via multiple instruments, both using remote and in situ measurements. Uh, minor species have also been discovered. So this is uh, different hydrocarbons and nitriles. Importantly, the uh, molecule benzene has been found. So this is an aromatic compound of six carbon rings in, connected in a ring with hydrogen wool on the outside. So this is, has important um, implications for prebiotic chemistry. Uh, one other thing I'd like to point out on this figure is the, the dashed line at the top right shows the extent of how deep Cassini traveled into um, Titan's atmosphere. So it reached a minimum altitude of about 850 kilometers. And you can just examine, thinking about the scale here, this is a, a much bigger atmosphere and ionosphere than com when compared to Earth, so known as an extended atmosphere. Okay. Uh, moving on to the ionosphere. So this was mainly, this is examined by the CAPS and INMS instruments. So positive ions, so the, yeah, these are in situ measurements of ions. So positive ions have been observed up to 1,100 mass units. Um, on the, and different ion groups have been identified up to 200 mass units. So that's in the top right. You can see there's a, a series of peaks, and these diff represent different mass groups. If you examine the spacings between the peaks of these mass groups, it's usually between a 12 to 14 mass unit spacing between them. So this indicates the, the carbon and nitrogen composition of these, these ions observed. Uh, one of the most um, stunning finds, and this wasn't predicted previously in before Cassini mission, was the discovery of negative ions using the, uh, the an electron spectrometer, an instrument designed to measure electrons. So, so far, uh, seven negative ion groups have been identified. And on the right, bottom right here, you can see an example of spectrogram. So these different groups. Um, these actually extend up to very, very high masses. So the largest have been found around 14,000 mass units. And it's been thought that these are um, precursors to the large haze molecules that give Titan its fuzzy appearance. So the, how, do the, how do these large molecules get made? So here, on the right here is a cartoon showing some of the various stages which I'll just run through. So the first stage is the ionization of molecular nitrogen and methane. So this ionization can occur from uh, energetic particles in Saturn's magnetosphere. So this is obviously a um, dominant process on the night side of Titan, uh, but also in, impacts on the day side. Uh, there is also obviously solar UV radiation, but that obviously only impacts on the day side of Titan. Uh, after this, this ionization of these molecules, there's several theories on how they grow into these larger and larger molecules. So one of the most favored hypotheses or what comes up a lot is these uh, ion neutral reactions. So usually la um, neutral molecules uh, reacting with small, smaller ions, so stuff from um, what was it, acetylene and uh, ethylene molecules. Um, moving on, going back to bring back into the benzene. So as you can see in the diagram, it grows bigger and bigger to these benzene molecules. And there's evidence for even larger um, aromatic compounds. So ones containing mul multiples of these rings. So, uh, and these structures can also contain nitrogen, so they're not always pure carbon rings. So they could, as is an example, uh, pyridine. So this is a benzene ring with one of the carbon molecules substituted for nitrogen. And, and again, these are very interesting compounds on how they relate to prebiotic chemistry, such as amino acids. Uh, so how did we find learn this stuff out? I'll be moving on to talking about the Cassini spacecraft and its instrumentation. So Cassini was a spacecraft sent to the Saturn system and it launched in 1997. It arrived at the Saturn system in 2004 and the mission ended in 2017. I'm sure a lot of you remember there was a lot of press about it as it was known as the grand finale where Cassini was deorbited into Saturn's atmosphere. 
the mission itself was a collaboration between NASA, ESA, and ASI, so the Italian Space Agency. It studied the planets, its rings, and all the, its many moons. It had a, a full scientific suite, so it had a whole array of instruments, including remote sensing, from infrared through UV, fields, waves, and particle instruments. And it also had radio and radar instruments for mapping. So I will be talking about the, the Cassini plasma spectrometer, also known as CAPS. So on the diagram there of Cassini, it's in the little blue box on the right. Uh, a little bit more in detail on the, on the CAPS instrument. So it's composed of three electrostatic analyzers. So these instruments that measure energy per charge ratios. So quickly running through them is the electron spectrometer, ELS at the top, which was designed to measure both thermal electrons found at Titan, energetic trapped electrons and auroral particles. <clears throat> the ion ma mass spectrometer, IMS, which was designed to measure composition of hot diffuse magnetospheric plasmas and low concentration ion species. And then finally, the ion beam spectrometer, IBS, which measures with very high angular and energy resolution. Um, designed to measure sharply defined beams and highly directional round fluxes. The whole instrument itself was mounted on an actuator, so this, this whole platform could spin around to increase its field of view. But I will be talking about data purely from the ion beam spectrometer, which measured positive ions. So a little bit of background on electrostatic analyzers. They yeah, as I said, they measure energy per charge ratios over a range of energies. These work through biasing two curved electrodes, so generating an electric field between the two electrodes. And as you can see in the top right diagram, this bends the particles. So depending on the strength of the electric field, but generated through how much you bias the electrodes, only particles of the of certain energies will travel through to these detectors at the bottom of these. Um, these curved ele hemispherical electrodes. So as I said, changing the bias, you can select different energies. So going back to IBS, so that can be seen in the bottom left of the bottom right diagram. This was designed at, with a energy range between one and 50,000 EV. And it sweeps through the, the energy range at a two second cadence and has an energy resolution of 0 0.014. Uh, so that's the delta E over E. Uh, one and one, <laughs> these are the only equations I'll show. So this is the explanation of the application in Titan's ionosphere. So given the high relative velocity of Cassini to the ions it's observing, uh, in the Cassini frame, these ions appear to be coming at the spacecraft at the spacecraft velocity of six kilometers a second. So the ions are related to the, at the energies the ions are seen at are the kinetic energies, which is related to the ion mass and the velocity of the spacecraft. So by just a simple inversion of kinet the uh, equation of kinetic energy, these energy spectra can be converted into mass spectra. Uh, as I said, these, the instrument measures energy per charge ratios. So all of this is done under the assumption of singly charged particles. If they were multiply charged, the, all these, the, so if they were doubly charged, you'd be talking about twice the masses, as you'd expect for singly charged. So during the Cassini mission, it, uh, uh, Cassini undertook around 100 close flybys of Titan during its 13-year stay at Saturn. Uh, for the study I will be talking about, I examined five flybys. These are known as the T, uh, T55 through T59. These took place between May 2009 and July 2009. In total, 440 energy sweeps were used to obtain good statistics for what I'll be talking about later. Uh, the trajectories of these five flybys, I'm sorry, yeah, it can be seen on the right here through uh, yeah, different, yeah, well, yeah, in three dimensions, you can see all the different ways to look at it. Uh, the, the altitude range I examined was between 
the the lowest that I have the data for, which is 950 kilometers, all the way up to 1,000 kilometers. Uh, this is the region where the heaviest ions are expected, or the heaviest ions we have the data for. There may be even heavier ions at lower um, altitudes, but we don't have the data for that. So yeah, as um, I've in the bottom left, I've highlighted that region again. So where it says heavy ions very conveniently is the altitude range I'm talking about. Uh, lastly, these flybys contain a mixture of day side and night side ionosphere. So T59, the region I examined was entirely in the night side ionosphere, while T50, T55 was in the night side, yeah. And T59 was all on the day side of the ionosphere. So there's slight variation between the flybys, what we're seeing. So finally, moving on to some data. This is an energy spectrogram from the T-59 flyby. So this was on the 24th of July, 2009. Uh, on the x-axis, you've got time. On the y-axis, you have the uh, energies measured in electron volts. And the color is the intensity shown in counts. So during these five flybys I'm talking about, the instrument was in a fixed actuation mode. So it looked directly into, uh, well, along the direction of travel. So all the ions were being uh, rammed into, into the instrument. Uh, the first feature you can notice is that there seems to be different bands at different energies. So these represent ions of different masses. So my methodology was taking one of these slices like this, going looking at a specific time and looking along the energies. And so if you if you take that data out and then you plot the energy on the x-axis and the intensity on the y, you can see the, this structure of these multiple peaks. So this is similar to what I, um, in the background when I was talking about the ionosphere. Uh, these, the low um, energy ions are seen over multiple bins. So this is due to the thermal velocity of the particles. But I'll be looking at the higher energy ions which relate to the higher masses. So everything to the right of the blue line has not been previously examined for ion composition. And these orange arrows show some of the peaks identified in this spectrum. Uh, this is all above no the noise level of the instrument as well. So going back to the spectrogram, and I, <laughs> I did this for across the entire thing, so building up sweep by sweep by sweep by sweep few more. And then if you plotted all the peaks I found across the energies, across the entire spectrogram, you can get something back like this. So clearly you can see the same bands at the lower energies across all these, the, the lines of dots. But as you go higher, you can see, you don't see as many, but again, in the range about 30 to 40, you can still see a few of them. So uh, the mass, a rough mass conversion is about 5.36. So anything above 40, well, yeah, never mind. I'll just move on. So everything, <laughs> everything above this white line here, um, again, is the region that's not been previously examined for the composition. And you can clearly see there are some light with the dots. There are some horizontal lines which correspond to. Uh, ions of specific masses, and you can see well, there's several lines corresponding to ions of different masses. Uh, apply this across the five flybys. So this will come up a lot when I'm using this, this C notation. So C, the C13 is the largest group previously examined, where the 13 and the, the, the number is the number of heavy um, atoms inside the molecule. So these are likely carbon, but can also represent nitrogen and oxygen. We cannot distinguish between them due to the limited resolution at these masses. Um, is that one I skipped, I think? Yeah. So there you can see some variations as well between the flyby. So comparing from the top left, you can see C, um, some groups like the C18 group don't appear, but if you go to the very the one at the bottom, C18, does appear in the T59, and I'll come back to that later. 
uh, another way to look at it. So apply the mg mass conversion. So this is a plot where mass is on the x axis, x axis, and the altitude is on the y axis. Uh, so several trends can be seen here. So the, the higher masses uh, occur more frequently at the lower altitude. So this is in agreement with what previously found. And looking across from the left, you can see these very narrow bands of the, the, the masses of where they occur. Um, going to higher, ma higher masses, they don't seem as, um, as narrow, I suppose. So section, this rectangle section, section B between 200 and 300 is the, the main region of interest of this study. So zooming in on that, there is still, you can still see some evidence of clustering, but in this mass range. So some of the ones I've highlighted at the bottom here, C16, around 203, you can see some clustering. Uh, other masses, so C, going up to C21, so it's around 266, you can see clusterings of these peaks. So all the um, error bars in the x-axis are due to, again, the uncertainty in the instrument resolution. Going forward with this, uh, by binning across at a one AMU resolution, you can um, view these in a different, in a, well, a simpler way, I suppose. So looking at this first examination of these two of ions above 200 mass units, you can see these clear peaks and troughs in the, um, the top panel there. So this top panel re represents the total number of occurrences of a peak at a, uh, at a mass across the mass range. Uh, these can be grouped into the different mass groups. So up to about the, the C21 group. Uh, these groups can be well identified. So each of these peaks are not, it's not a true mass spectrum. It just represents a, a high, a, a high occurrence, high, the, frequently occurring peak of a specific mass. Uh, in the bottom panel here is, you, is the percentage occurrence. So this allows comparison between the different flybys. Uh, as you can see, as I've mentioned before, there is some variation. C18 is obviously uh, an example that sticks out a lot as it, in the T55 through T57, it does not occur much, but then from T58 T59, it starts occurring a lot more. Uh, one other um, section I'll cover is the, the average spacing between the groups, as this uh, helps to understand the formation mechanism by seeing what is the sort of base unit that is added for these molecules to grow. So this was studied by uh, cross-checking between all the different groups and taking the average of it. So the average spacing came out around 12 and a half mass units. Uh, there are two outliers here as well at 262 and 299 where the average spacing drops a lot. So these do not seem to fit into the same chemical scheme. Um, and I will come back to that in a minute. So Examining the masses of these, these frequently occurring ions, they're all found to be consistent with masses of polycyclic aromatic compounds, so these, these multiply ring structures. I've got a couple examples on the right. Now, these are non-exhaustive. These aren't all the molecules that can exist at this mass. They're just examples of some of the polycyclic ones which are consistent. So the C16H11 at 203, and C15H9N plus at 203 as well, showing that you could also have these nitrogen bearing variations. So that's those, both of those would correlate to this 203 mass peak found in the data. And again, there's the, there's the 217 peak, and this could be related to these both four ring structures, which one of them is, could be oxygen bearing as well. Um, other, other explanations have been investigated, such as long linear chains of alkanes and stuff like polyacetylene and polyenes um, and fullerenes as well, as you get some, the smaller fullerenes do, are in this mass range, but none of these work found to be consistent with all the peaks that are observed. 
um, above to about 275 mass units. So above the, the C21 group, the, we can no mass groups were well defined. This could be due to the limited en energy resolution, which could be smearing it out somehow, but it also could be due to negative ion chemistry becoming prevalent because as we see, these negative ions exist very to very large masses and there could be a transition region between the um, what sort of chemistry is dominant at the masses, at different masses. Uh, a couple more points to bring up. So coming back to the spacing, so of this 12 and a half mass unit spacing, so this is likely due to a carbon or uh, carbon hydrogen addition. If you remove the outliers at 266 and 299 mass units, it uh, rises to 12.84, indicating that this CH addition is likely. Uh, looking at previous theories of how these molecules formed, there's one put forward for a methylene addition, so removing one of the hydrogen atoms on the outside and replacing it with a yeah a CH2 ion. So this uh, this would be consistent with the addition of a a carbon hydrogen molecule. Yeah, for, well the mass difference between them when you add it. Uh, examining the variations between flybys. So for some groups, like particularly C18, you see this, as I mentioned previously. This could be linked to um, photochemistry on Titan's day ion sphere. So these later ones where it occurs more, so T58 and T59, they're a lot more on the, the day side, which could be, yeah, you get the solar UV radiation on that side. It could also be related to Again, the negative ion chemistry being dampened on the day side relative to the positive ions. So, bringing this, trying to bring this all together, why, why is this all important? So, in in Titan's atmosphere, there's a main tholin haze layer that exists at 100 to 210 kilometers. So, this is a good seven, eight hundred kilometers less than the where we studied, but the, this haze layer consists of these very large molecules, which are thousands of mass units. And the theory is that these molecules get formed higher in the atmosphere and grow as they descend. So understanding what sort of ions are, exist high in the ionosphere, help to understand what um, creates these large aerosols and tholins in the haze layers. Um, so yeah, these, these finds help understand that. Uh, furthermore, these, the tholins and aerosols in the haze are also expended to descend all the way to the surface. So on the right here is a picture from the Huygens probe, the surface. So what impacts these very large molecules have on the surface biology, chemistry, and geology, it, it's still a very open question. So understanding what we should expect to find on the surface is important. Uh, I'll just give a shout out for admission. I'm very excited to to see selected. So this is this is dra the Dragonfly mission, which is selected as the fourth mission in the NASA's New Frontiers program. It's uh, supposed to be launching in 2026 and landing in 2034. It's um, studying prebiotic chemistry on the surface and is looking for biosignatures such as amino acids. So as you can see from the little picture here. It's a it's a quadcopter, but it's not the sort of size of quadcopter you'd usually expect. That is actually the size of a Land Rover, so <laughs> much larger than the sort of drones you think about. Um, it's a uh, equipped with these four in, um, four different instruments. the The mass spectrometer is the instrument that will be examining the surface composition. So hopefully, by understanding what we expect to see on the surface it will help inform what they, with their analysis of the surface composition. Yeah. Uh, in conclusion, using in situ data, the positive ion composition between 170 and 310 mass units was examined. Uh, positive ion groups between 200 and 275 have been identified, and these represent the largest identified ion groups in Titan's ionosphere. 
and this will help inform future chemical modeling and or so aerosol modeling. The ion masses and the spacing between the abundant ions are consistent with positive ions relating to polycyclic aromatic compounds, so these multiple fused ring structures, and they will find they, these will help understand the processes that take these small ions seen in the upper in the ionosphere and how that transition into these very large aerosols and tholins seen in the lower atmosphere as well as on the surface. So everyone, thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.